Welcome back everyone to the lecture about applied biomes analysis. In this part will be about machine learning for pixel classification, mainly pixel classification in Fiji. So when you look in Fiji and uh, you try to find machine learning algorithms in there, what jumps to your view immediately um, is the so-called uh, trainable VECA segmentation. VECA stands for the Vekarpo Environment for Knowledge Analysis. Um, that's a university in New Zealand. They developed this kind of software library many years ago, and uh, Ignacio uh, was uh, developing a Fiji plugin. And he did not do it alone, there were quite some people involved, um, but he was leading this project some years ago. And I think for something like four or five years, we have it now available in Fiji and uh, can, can, can use machine learning without knowing too much about the technical details behind. And that's actually quite practical. Um, and there's a website where you can read more details. It will actually tell you um, very similar things like I told you earlier. You take your original input image, you derive different image features. So it's like different blurred images, edge images, diff applying different filters um, to your input image. Then you take these features for every individual pixel and you train a classifier or you apply a classifier um, to make a so-called, I mean, a segmentation, a, class, a pixel classification. Um, and that can be more than just binary, so it don't have to be just black and white. It can also be, like you see here in this example, red, green, blue, and you can make quite different num a different number of pixel classes. So before I dig deeper into this, so you find here some slides with detailed explanation, but I think I will just show you live. So let's let's take this example, which is from the um, broad bioimage segmentation challenge some years ago. Um, you find it in the folder uh, next to the slides, and you find also a link to where this data comes from. It's just a very super small crop from data from from Uncarbentas lab, which we now will just use for 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 training segmentation. If you search for the trainable vector segmentation, I will not go through the menu. I will just enter here trainable vector, um, and you see there is one for two D and one for three D. For today, it's also three D takes a bit longer; it's a bit slower. Um, we will just run. Um, the two-dimensional version of that. And you see a new window pops up. It also has some additional information here down in this window. Um, and without doing anything like setting up uh, complicated feature selections and random forest, we can just start outlining here in this image. That's actually, uh, actually quite cool that the software allows us to immediately go ahead with something. So for example, I draw a line in here and I say this should be a this is part of my class one. Yeah, so when I will outline another cell and I will also add this one to class one. And I can go ahead and annotate some cells and tell the software that the pixels I just annotated, the pixels along the line I was drawing um, are all cells. So this is my class one. And then I also draw a line outside and I say, okay, this should be class two. So this is not cells. So we make a binary decision here, cell, no cell, right? Um, and then I can train a classifier, which is obviously also super fast, um, which makes a nice decision uh, between green and red. And I can also, for example, toggle the overlay and turn it off and on again to see how good it was. And it's kind of obvious um, that there are quite some pixels here marked in red, um, which is are actually no cells. And furthermore, it would be nice if we could differentiate these cells from each other later on. So it is making a binary decision in this particular case, but it would be nice if we had an easier play of segmenting the objects later on um, when we continue with this binary object. And there the trick now would be um, we annotate more background pixels where the segmentation now, the, the classification now was wrong. So we do this by uh, drawing an additional line here in between and adding also this to class two. And then we train the classifier again and we see it became better, right? So it became better from this point of view, but it also became worse, for example, up here. Um, there are some pixels which are obviously actually inside uh, a cell, but which are now classified as outside of the cell. So, and so we can correct this again. And then we can also do it over here. And we train the classifier again. And when we do this a couple of times, so it's like, uh, and, and we, we, we train an algorithm, we look how good it is, then we correct it, then we train it again and again and again, and we come to a point where our pixel classifier is from our visual point of view during the training. Um, furthermore, 
Um, what I want to show you in the in the, in the back hard turnable segmentation, you can in the settings dialog, um, you can here select uh, different features which should be taken into account. So, for example, if you want to make it faster, so that's what I heard, so that I tried it often. But um, if you turn off the membrane projections, it should actually be a lot of faster, uh, especially when you process big images, right? Um, furthermore, what you can also do, you can save uh, this feature stack. So this, so this is all the features which are generated from your two-dimensional image. So this is the, the so the feature stack contains all the differently blurred images, um, all the features you have selected, which are derived from your two-dimensional image. So if we save this one to disk, so for example here in the folder where the slides are, um, we can then also open it and have a look at it. Yeah, so, and here you see when I now go through the stack. So that's obviously edge images and different filters and kind of different radii, different sigmas applied to it. And then all together it's 76 in this particular case. So it's like really just not taking three images into account, but a lot of them. So that's what I mentioned earlier. And then uh, when you are confident by the end, and of course after some training and proper feature selection and training again and annotating everything um, after some time, you first of all you can save this classifier and you can also apply it again to different images and then find out how the classifier processes different images but also a very important tool you can create a result which gives you an image out which looks like that so we have now green and red here unfortunately and not black and white so in order to to be able to post process this image we have to turn it into 8-bit um, and maybe we have to threshold it as well. So now we see here um, 85 and 155 as intensities. It's like for post-processing of binary image, it's not so not so obvious. But if we had images with several classes and not just two, then this is the way to go. And this is why it's implemented like that. Um, so let's just um, adjust a threshold. For example, um, this one is really like random selection. We have two intensities. Every algorithm should be able to differentiate that. Um, and then we could continue processing like this, right? So this is how, how you get a binary image um, out of the trainable Becker segmentation. Um, what I also would like to mention, because it's in, in many projects that's actually quite uh, important, um, so getting a binary result out is the one thing. What you might be interested in as well is um, getting the probabilities out. So we have two classes, so we wanted to differentiate between foreground and background and the algorithm internally anyway um, determines the probability of a pixel belonging to foreground or background. So when you now move in this image here, you move with the mouse around, you see that the probability of the pixel becoming to uh, belonging to foreground here in this region is almost zero, right? And as soon as we come to a point where there is a cell, the probability increases to 0.98. So you see that in the main window, right? And you could actually, instead of post-processing a binary image, you could actually post-process also the probability map, which we are looking at here now. Furthermore, this image has two channels, um, because this is class 1 and this is class 2, which is kind of obviously uh, inverse in this particular case. We have foreground and background, and pixels cannot belong to both of them, so the probability um, is kind of lower in the one case, where it's higher in the other case. So um, this is basically a trainable vector segmentation. As you may agree, it's a super easy to use tool. You just turn it on Twitchy, you outline something, you can train a classifier, you can save a classifier, you can reload a classifier and process images. So that's very handy, let's say. If you use it, please cite it. So there's a scientific publication about it, um, uh, again by Ignacio, nice guy. Um, and you may want to, to promote um, his research uh, in, in a way that, that people like Ignacio can continue working on projects like that only if we cite their algorithms, if we cite their software properly. Um, then there's another tool in Fiji, it's called LabKit, um, developed here in Dresden actually, in Florian Luke's lab, um, precisely by Matthias Arts mainly, um, which is uh, basically, it also uses Vecca in the background, um, but it's more sophisticated when it comes to um, uh, processing big images. So VECA is limited to images which match in memory. And furthermore, if you think about it, um, from this image, a Gaussian blur is calculated and another Gaussian blur, and then there's edge images and so on and so on and so on. So it's like many images are generated out of this original one image. So it's actually quite memory limited. And to overcome this memory, memory limitation, the people in UGLAB started working on that. 
and they called it the labeling kit or short lab kit. And so you can uh, install it by, by activating the lab kit update site in ImageJ. You should have learned already how to activate an update site. And furthermore, when you start it for the very first time, it tells you you can press F1. Unfortunately, the F1 key doesn't work. <laughs> I don't know why. Um, but there's two websites um, which can help you uh, with the shortcuts of the software. So imagej.net slash labkit. And the viewer you see in here, uh, which displays all the cells, is actually the big data viewer. That's why it works with big data. Uh, they have two independent websites where you can learn a bit the shortcuts and how to how to easily deal with the viewers. I think I will not go through the slides in detail. I will just um, show it live, um, but you find some details um, of how to deal with certain issues. So the starting point is again the same. I have WebKit installed anyway. Um, so I will just um, start from this image and run LabKit on it by searching for LabKit in the search field, right? So now this window pops up, and one of the first things you have to do, or you should do, um, is uh, you should change from the move mode, where you can move the view around, in this case it's rotating, um, you should move to the draw, you should switch to the draw mode, and if you, for example, want to annotate cells, you should start with the foreground, obviously, right? So and then you can, you already see here, um, how this foreground is written in the image, and then you can annotate in the same way, um, as you know from Weka. Um, it's sometimes uh, quite convenient that you can change, for example, the background. For the background, you can change the size of the brush. So depending on what you want to outline and for what purpose, um, it might make a lot of sense um, to, to change the brush size. And then the technology behind is actually working exactly the same. So you outline things in this image, and then you train a classifier. Um, before training the classifier, you should maybe also check the classifier settings. So for example, you find here the number or the list of features which are analyzed, and you can read this dialog like that. So the original image is analyzed, and the difference of Gaussians of the original image are analyzed with different radii. So and if you, for example, have you want to detect super big objects, then you should not investigate in the difference of Gaussian with a radius of 1, but rather with a radius of 20, right? So um, this is how, how you can configure these things in, in such dialogues. But usually, I mean, especially in these examples here, um, the default settings are quite good for differentiating cells from background. And the principle is basically the same as in Vecca, so we can train a classifier, which takes a second, and then <laughs> Segmentation result looks already quite good. Um, if we would not be happy here at that point, we could still um, try to correct outlines. For example, I will now draw here an additional blue line um, and I will train the classifier again. Um, and so the procedure uh, is, is, is uh, basically the same for correcting segmentation results um, in this tool. Yeah, and at some point you get a really good segmentation out. Um, which you can then export to ImageJ by saying, I want to show the segmentation result in ImageJ. So we get an image out like that. And if in this image, when I zoom in and move around with my mouse, I will realize that the background pixels are zero and the foreground pixels are one. So that's similar like in the Vecca case, if I want to post-process this image. So for example, if I want to uh, apply a binary dilation to it, I get an error message out, like this is not working because this is not a proper binary image. And in order to fix that, you multiply this image with 255. So, so far the pixel intensities were 0 and 1, yes and no, binary, right? Um, and in order to get a, a proper binary image out, which is understood by image J as a binary image, we have to have pixel intensities of 0 and 255, and then we can uh, post-process this image. For example, by Aya, ah, and we have to make it 8-bit, <laughs> which just means we have to change the type. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, and then we can dilate a road, watershed, whatever we want to do. So this is kind of necessary in order to convert um, a lab kit segmentation result. Um, into a binary image, which is understood by ImageJ. Last but not least, I would like to show you, uh, it's it's an academic machine learning tool. So it's like, I would not use it in research project, at least not yet. 
And but for playing with object classification in image J, it might be very nice um, because it, it, it targets a bit um, user convenience. So if you were following the GPU accelerated image processing session two weeks ago and you have installed CLIJ already, then you don't have to install anything now. You have this thing already installed. Otherwise, um, please activate the CLIJ and CLIJ2 update sites and you get another tool um, which is called the Glitch X Vecar Object Classification. And I will just show you how it works instead of explaining you the slides in detail. Yeah, so we again start at this image and we will now, let's do it this time uh, on a GPU, we will apply an O2 segmentation thresholding algorithm which has no parameters except the input image, right? So we have now two images, zoom. So we have a binary image and we have the original gray value image, which is basically necessary for visualization. And we'll now do the object classification. Yeah, so Kitch X Vekar object classification. And it asks us for two images. So for example, um, the input image, this is this one, we have to enter here the right name, so that's AS something, um, and the a binary image, so the segmented object in the second image, and for example, I will just for fun, I will enter now three classes. Here you see, um, there was just a bar added to this image, and we furthermore now see outlines here. So let me zoom in. Um, that's also necessary in order to get the bar of the right size. So again, this is a research tool, right? Um, not fully developed. And now we can select here, for example, class one, class two, class three, and we can annotate our objects just by clicking at them. If you misleadingly annotated one, then you can also undo a, a selection by clicking again. So I will now just select for fun two of them like that. Then I want to have um, the bright objects, um, the bright and big objects in green, and maybe the a bit too big objects which are connected to each other in this color. And then I will set measurements. So that's feature selection, right? So if I, for example, would like to take into account the area, so this is big ones, and the intensity, this is mean gray value, and also shape descriptors, then I set these three checkboxes. And later in the exercise, I would just ask you to do it independently with these three checkboxes and see what the results are to get a bit of feeling for what object classification actually means. Um, so I click on OK here, and I click on Train. Also here is uh, some windows popping up. And then it gives us the classification of these objects. So this is, um, I would say, for, for just playing with different features, with different selections, that's quite convenient and a super simple tool, but it's for academic purposes again. Yeah? So this is not like um, a tool you should use in research for, for processing thousands of images. This is like in the making, let's say. Um, but you can see that it nicely uh, puts these different colors on all the objects, so it classified all of them. And also here you can um, save the classifier and apply it to a different object by loading it in a different object. Yeah, so this is the this is the way how you can do very simple object classification in ImageJ, actually running on a graphics card in the background. Okay, so this is it for now. Um, uh, we'll, the next uh, sub-lesson will be about machine learning for pixel and object classification in Elastic, a much more powerful tool. Um, so see you soon.